Welcome to the Honest Mamas Podcast, where we talk about the emotional and spiritual aspects of the motherhood journey. We are a team of honest mamas, myself, Melissa, Sophie, and Claire. We are psychotherapists, moms, and friends. Join us as we get real about the topics that matter to you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 41 of the Honest Mamas podcast. This is Claire. Today, you will hear a conversation I had with psychotherapist and author Sean Grover. His book, When Kids Call the Shots, How to Seize Control from Your Darling Bully and Enjoy Being a Parent Again, is a fantastic resource for parents dealing with kids that feel like bullies. Sean maintains one of the largest group therapy practices in the United States. He's an inspiring speaker and a designer of award-winning youth programs. He's also been quoted in numerous publications, including Newsweek, New York Magazine, and the Wall Street Journal about parent-child relationships. In the interview, Sean generously shares very useful case examples to illustrate the ideas outlined in his book. I found his perspective to be very helpful and really inspiring. Being bullied by a child is incredibly painful, and Sean shows us how to understand the experience differently and provides hope for change. Here is my interview with Sean. Hi, Sean. Welcome to the Honest Mamas podcast. Thanks so much for being here today. Hello, Claire. Thanks for having me. I'm a big fan of your website. Oh, love it. <laughs> Appreciate that. So as you well know, we're here today to talk about your book, the title of which I explained in the intro. And the thing I really love about your book is that you, in the beginning, you you kind of tell on yourself, you tell your own experience about parenting and parenting one of your kids or both of your kids. And I really appreciated that, first of all. So I want to thank you for being so open and honest, because I think one of the things parents tend to do is we kind of hide our dirty laundry sometimes or our difficulties. Oh, absolutely. And as therapists, we tend to be such smarty pants. <laughs> And so we think we have all the answers, but I'll tell you, this book was built on my personal parenting disasters, everything I tried that went wrong. And I actually started writing it in, a, in such a place of despair, mm -hmm. uh, just trying to figure out what, what wasn't working, you know, what I learned in school wasn't working and so forth. So I thought I'll start with a confession and yeah. then maybe if parents choose to continue, continue reading, they'll get a sense that I'm one of them too. Yeah. I'm struggling too. Yeah, no, I really, really appreciate that point of view and that willingness. And, you know, like you said, before we have kids, we think, you know, hey, it looks it looks pretty manageable. You know, I mean, all these people that complain, they're probably just weak. You know, they're probably just, they, you know, they don't know that much. Mm -hmm. But me, I'm different. I can do it. You know, I, I have the, the strength and the willpower. And I think therapists tend to think that even more because, you know, we think we've had training and this should this should kind of be pretty easy, but it's it's even more humbling, perhaps, for, for our group of, of parents. Absolutely. You know, I, I, for years, I set up uh, programs in elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, and some very tough schools, difficult situations, working with parents or schools that were really under uh, underserviced and mm. lots of dropout range. And so I was always thrown into these very chaotic situations with parents and their children. And my nickname was Mr. Unflappable. <laughs> but I'll tell you, I was so flappable as a parent. Yeah. When I, when I transitioned into parenthood, all that uh, skill and knowledge and mm. brilliant education suddenly was, I couldn't access it. It didn't apply. Yeah. That's a wonderful distinction because I think, you know, our kids really have this very specific ability or, or kind of a, a strange superpower to push our personal, personal buttons versus, you know, kids, kids, it, people are teachers, people work with kids all the time. And it's just, it's a completely different role. So I think for parents to, to know that is really important. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So also, as you outline in your book, parenting is changing and the parenting of our previous generation is, is kind of, is quite different from what a lot of us are are trying to do. Can you explain a little bit about that as far as from your point of view? Well, parenting, well, whenever I do a parenting workshop, it always interests me right at the get-go. I'll say, who here, uh, whose parents here attended a parenting workshop? Mm. And inevitably, almost no hands go up. <laughs> whose parents read a parenting book? No hands go up. So parenting really, I'd say in the last decade or so, 
has really become a much more active, respected task that we have this, to raise this new life. So I think in the old days, you know, parenting was just a, a something you checked off. I got married, check. I had a kid, check. I got a car, check. And there really wasn't as much thought or planning into it. It was kind of invented as you go along. Mm -hmm. But parents today, I take this so seriously. I, I'll look out during a parenting workshop and I'll see people writing in notebooks and mm. raising their hands. Can you say that again? You know, so I find it thrilling that people take it so seriously and really, really want to do the best they can for their kids. Yeah, it's so interesting. And I guess I wonder exactly what that shift was, you know, if it's partly awareness and, and accessibility of information, these ideas about our emotional selves, I guess, partly it's people being more open to emotional life and the importance of feelings and kind of the impacts long term if those if those feelings aren't aren't nurtured or or cared for i don't know anything else you can think of that that has contributed to that shift well i think there's a much more of a sense of uh, community around this i think you're right with technology mm -hmm. and television and mm -hmm. and suddenly these parenting experts emerging everywhere i think there's more of a conscious shift of the role we have to play in our child's lives. And also we have our own childhood to call upon. So yeah. uh, many parents set off into parenting wanting to give their child a better experience. I, that may even be a universal parenting goal. Mm. Is that I, want my, I want to do better for my child. Even if your parents did great, you, you want to do even greater for yeah. them. Yeah. So I think uh, that shift has occurred and it's come with some real challenges, which would, which sort of inspired this book. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, it also occurs to me that, you know, because I don't know, maybe previous generations were more concerned with just kind of basic survival in some respects, you know, and the roles were so were more defined, you know, as between men and women. And now it just seems like there's, there's more space, there's more room to think about these things. So that's just another, another thought. Yes. Well, I think of, you know, parenting was kind of you were in a role as a parent or a husband or as a wife. There were these sort of very firmly defined roles. But today it's much more of a partnership. So men do things that maybe women would have done in the past and vice versa. And with the sort of gender mm -hmm. revolution going on, we're at a much different place than we've we've ever been in history. Right. So it sounds like you know, some of these, some of these shifts have, have either made us more aware of our relationship to kids that can become kind of this bullying dynamic that you're talking about, or maybe this, this kind of, I guess what I'm trying to ask you is, do you think that this, this tendency or this, this reality that sometimes kids bully their parents and parents are in that bullying relationship, is that something new? Well, the, the bully dynamic, I think if we take a step back and look at like basic uh, child development, Mother Nature has really put parents and their children on a collision course at a number of times in their lives. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you look at a, a child learning to walk, once the child wanna, can walk, they, they want to hold your hand, they push your hand away, and then when they can run, they want to run away. Mm -hmm. So the parent is constantly put in this role of being such a downer I mean, just like, <laughs> no stop that no there's traffic right no, uh, you can't do this you can't do that no 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 and no child likes that no one likes being controlled i don't care what age you are someone controlling you just does not feel good mm -hmm. so the I, that dynamic has always been there right yeah. but i think parents today and we can get into their history a little bit they feel bad if mm -hmm. their child is upset at them. They feel bad if uh, their child is angry at them or if their child is crying and they feel guilty. Oh, I've done something wrong. Mm -hmm. and so or what rejected, happens rejected, like push my hand. Like, great, you don't love me. <laughs> that's right. You know, I, I, I had a mother in my office the other day and uh, uh, she was really upset and really a wonderful wo woman and doing a really fine job. And her son had turned just turned into a teenager and she we were arguing, uh, she was arguing and I was mediating with her son. Mm. And she said, I feel so rejected by you. Aww. I feel so pushed away by you. And actually that was the time of life where he, that's what he's supposed to be doing. Right. But she felt abandoned. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. So uh, I would spend a lot of time talking about where that resonates in her life and where does that feeling spring from and how is that getting tangled up mm. inside your relationship with your child? And that was really the inspiration was the book for the book was to really help parents unearth these kind of uh, principles that they grew up with and the choices that they make and take a sort of reflective pause mm -hmm. and think about, hey, why am I doing that? Or I seem to be getting angry a lot or how can I manage this differently rather than focus exclusively on the child? When a publisher called me about this book, I had written a book, which was a manual for parents to work on themselves. Mm -hmm. And the publisher called me and said, oh, we really like this book. It's got some really interesting ideas and it's got original voice. And uh, I said, great. you know." And they said, they only have one problem. It's never going to sell. And I said, why? And they said, because <laughs> parents want to blame their children. Oh, wow. They don't want to work on themselves. And I, I That's sat there. so sad, but true. I know. <laughs> I sat there in this conundrum and I called my friends and I called my mentors and I called, they want me to change the book. And mm. so, uh, kind of basically, a crisis of conscience for you. Sounds that's like. right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we came up with a deal and a, a friend of mine, after the book was published, uh, she bought it and she called me and she said, Hey, nice bait and switch. <laughs> and right. she could see that. The number of chapters making asking for parents to work on themselves and giving them specific exercises and tasks and journaling and uh, all that stuff, that's still there. Mm -hmm. But the publisher snuck it by us. Wow. Yeah. And it says a lot. I mean, it really says a lot about our culture, I guess, and the culture of parenting that we've kind of, we do tend to focus on our kids, focus on what's going wrong and really try to figure out what's wrong with them. If these kids would just, you know, behave, if they would just do as they're told, you know, that's everything right. would be fine. And that's such a bore. I mean, every generation does that. Yeah. It's just uh it's just such a bore. We've got to do better than that. Mm -hmm. uh, blaming our kids. Definitely. So, why, you know, do you think that are all parents vulnerable to this? You know what I mean? Or are there certain, are there parents with certain types of vulnerabilities that you think are more likely to get in a bullying dynamic with their child? Well, generally, yeah, I would, the, the parents, they get into a bullying dynamic. They're, they're good parents. I mean, their heart is in the right place. They really want to do the best they can, mm -hmm. but there's, there's something uh, in their history or something that's happened. I talk about the three types of parents and these are just broad generalizations, of course, but three sort of types of parents who find themselves in this dilemma, mm -hmm. you know, and the first parent would be the guilty parent, which mm -hmm. means something has gone wrong. Uh, there's a, maybe there's a, a sibling who's sick or unstable, or maybe there's a financial crisis, or maybe there's illness or death in the family, mm -hmm. or maybe there's a divorce. Something's disrupted their life. Mm -hmm. And the parent feels guilty. They look at their child and think, oh my goodness, they're not going to have this experience or I'm neglecting them in some way. Mm -hmm. So to counter that guilty feeling, they begin to indulge the child, reward the child. They don't expect too much from the child because after all, they're, they, going they're in a difficult so much, position. Yeah. They're mm -hmm. going through so much. You right. know, so, uh, so then the child begins to sense very early on that they can sort of seize a bit of leadership there. Mm -hmm. They can start to order the parent around or demand certain things or push the parent around. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's when the dynamic really begins to shift and you move from sort of a, what I would call a testing period where every child tests the parent, the parent sets the limit and everyone goes on. But the child starts to test the parent, the mm -hmm. parent doesn't set the limit, the child begins to step into that role. And you actually find by the time kids get to my office, maybe in middle school, you can actually hear the child parenting the parent. Wow. What does that parent, sound like? Oh, it's awful. I want to jump out the window when that happens. <laughs> uh, they'll, they'll tell them, be quiet. Don't interrupt me. Oh, I was talking. Ouch. They'll make snarky remarks. They'll mm. say rude things. They'll call their parents names. And I thought that this was just rare thing that maybe was happening in New York. And then, you know, the book has been published in Korea, China, oh. and Russia so far. So it seems to be a dynamic that is, is, is common in different cultures. 
Fascinating. Wow. Well, and you, you talk about, you know, talking about that, you're saying that the kid kind of steps into a leadership role. And I'm sure that that comes with a feeling of power and mastery for the child. But I can imagine that there might be other feelings underneath those feelings. Oh, yeah. Well, a child without limits or without boundaries really is very anxious. Mm -hmm. The world is not safe. When I work with parents and uh, we reboot their parenting style and we start adding a healthier structures to the family, there's some kickback from the child. Generally, they resist. But all the parents say within a day or two, things are moving much smoother. Wow. You know, going, things quickly. are going much well. Wow. Well, absolutely. If, but if depending on your age of the child and you want to do this as early as possible, mm -hmm. they are relieved. If you ever worked for a boss who wasn't clear who was vague and contradicted themselves constantly, yeah. you're gonna, you were demoralized. And yeah. you, you were, uh, if you worked with a staff, everyone was at each other. Siblings go at each other. If siblings go at each other, I always tell parents, and it can be a little mean, that that is not uh, a problem caused by those children. That is a failure of the parents to yeah. provide enough structure for them. So, wow. yeah. Yeah, yeah you, you say in the book that, you know, this dynamic is a sign of an imbalance in the family. And it sounds like right. you're referring to this idea that the, you know, the parents are really the CEOs. They're the, the top of the heap. They need to make the rules and be consistent in the rules and clear with the rules so that everyone else knows what they are to do. And when those things aren't happening, yeah, people start That's right. trying to take, take and gain in control. Well, you, every family has its own culture. Mm -hmm. Every family has a way of talking to each other, has behavior that's acceptable, that's not acceptable. Uh, so we, we tend to move through these cultures in a sort of unconscious way. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm asking in the book is for people to really consciously sit down and think about how are they managing their kids? What kind of, what are you passing on to them? What kind mm -hmm. of culture are they going to take, you know, when they leave this family and right. really start to shine a light on those things we don't think about normally in daily life. Yeah, so true. Well, and I can share in my own life. I mean, I'm I'm married to a man from originally from India, and we culturally just have very big differences, you know, just about how we <laughs> just how we perceive certain things structurally in the family. And if there are differences, it can be difficult for the kids at times. I know for our kids because we're still struggling to kind of figure out, well, who's whose culture is going to win out here, you know? Are we going to be kind of do my strict German culture thing? Or are we going to do the little bit more relaxed Indian culture thing around certain um, family experiences like mealtimes or bedtimes or that's right um, what we do for fun or uh, et cetera, et cetera. So parents, it can be a struggle just for parents to get on the same page. Well, that's, that's, that's so crucial. You know, we, if you have parents with different parenting styles and let's say there's a lot of conflict around those different parenting styles, for instance, it's not, a common dynamic would be one of the parents is, are the taskmaster. They make take care of homework and they make sure people are dressed and out the door. And the other parent becomes sort of the fun parent, mm -hmm. <laughs> Get, takes the movies and they do trips. And, and, right. and so this Let's imbalance wrestle. and mm -hmm. if this, yes, the, the, the friction between these two, you figure you have to, your child internalizes both parents. And from those raw materials, they sort of develop their own sense of themselves. Well, if they're internalizing two parents that are in conflict, you'll yeah. find these children tend to be more anxious, tend to have trouble making decisions, mm. tend to have trouble defining themselves or standing up for themselves. They're very hesitant to get involved with conflicts because this is what they've learned um, uh, through their household. So wow. often I'll work exclusively with parents on mm -hmm. their parenting style and the family will begin to evolve very rapidly because uh, they're in charge. Yeah, well, and that's very, I mean, it's exciting. It's exciting to hear that you can see families shifting rather quickly once some of these things are established, some of these new parenting styles and new um, structures are put in place with everyone being in agreement. <laughs> right. Every, yeah, we're right. That we have to cooperate. We have yeah. to, they have to be on board and ready to do this. Well, and that kids are resilient, you know, that yes, there can be some really bad habits, but with enough structure and consistency, Kids can actually shift quite quickly, which I think is very reassuring. That's right. And par well, parents, you know, I'm sure you recognize this yourself, but we live in, often in such a state of self-neglect that mm. we, we give and give and give. So with our partners, we're exhausted, we're tired, we're 
or hungry. We don't talk about things until there's a crisis or you don't discover someone's parenting ideas until you're co-parenting with them. Right. So, uh, you know, also in the book, I really talk about sitting down with your partner when you're well rested, when you go on your weekly date to dinner, if you can do that <laughs> and talk about the state of our parenting. Yeah. Then we can have it. That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Well, and, you know, and just to be completely honest, those conversations can take a long time. I mean, it can take a while to figure things out. I mean, I know for my husband and myself, we, because we've had some challenges with our son and we've seen things from different perspectives, we've really had to talk it out. And it's taken time and it's taken a lot of energy and it's taken a lot of energy that sometimes we just don't feel that we have, but we do it. And it's been worth it, but it's been a process. So I think it's also important just to name that it can take some time to kind of, yeah, you know, kind of grapple with some of these these differences that exist in the parenting dyad. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I always try to uh, ask parents to focus on, let's put our egos aside for a second. Mm -hmm. Let's not worry about who's right, ego. who's who, wrong. Who has an ego? <laughs> I know. Some families being right is who's like, stubborn? Being, I'm There's right. No there's no stubbornness in this in my diet. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> but yes, but I think absolutely. the uni universal idea that parents want to do the best for the children. If I can tap into that, I can get parents to behave a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> well, so you talked about the guilty parent. What's the next yes. type? The, the next type would be the anxious parent. This, I, this is generally a, an anxious person. They sort of, uh, they worry a lot about things. Uh, they're they're constantly seeing uh, potential disasters in the making. They have they're full of cautionary tales. Yeah. Like never stand under a tree during lightning. <laughs> they, they sort of fill your child with all these warning signals. I don't oh, think no. my mother's. <laughs> this could be <laughs> me. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I could tell you stories. <laughs> you know, so what they they the uh, anxiety is a lot like electricity in a way. If you get two circuits close enough they'll jump. Mm -hmm. They won't touch. They will jump. So an anxious person will induce anxiety in their kid. Yeah. Uh, so the child may become very anxious and not know why. Or if a, if a parent is constantly expressing worry, I'm worried about you and all, over and over in different ways. Did you do that? Did you do this? What they see between the lines is they begin to feel like you don't believe in me. Mm. You don't trust me. Yeah. You don't think I'm a capable person. And that hurts their feelings. So now they're going to start pushing back, pushing back, pushing back. So again, with the anxious parent, which, by the way, I am all these things. I am the guilty parent. Well, I was going to ask you parent. what happens uh, when it's all three. <laughs> the trifecta. We, are, are we, are we all? We, we are trifecta. <sighs> this is frightening. <laughs> we all have bits and pieces of these things. Yeah. We can't compartmentalize them so so neatly. I know. When uh, you have to write a book, the you anxious have to do that, yeah. I know people love lists and they like yeah. uh, do these three things and you'll have a perfect family. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but again, tending to the parents anxiety first mm -hmm. and giving them space to talk and, and relieve themselves. And I always want to know, how are they taking care of themselves? Are they exercising? Are they doing something creative? What is their passion? Mm -hmm. These are great models for children. If you have a parent that's really pursuing something they love or has hobbies that they really take delight in, Children are proud of their parents. They'll show off their parents. Yeah, that's but an anxious so cute parent, when that happens. Oh, so yeah, cute. an anxious parent tends to sacrifice so mm -hmm. much, uh, and then the child feels bad. That maybe they begin to fantasize. Well, maybe if I wasn't born, my parent would be happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that can really be a huge blow to the self esteem, and like you said, maybe build up resentment over time, which looks like bullying. That's right, because you're you're pushing back. You know, I had this. Uh, this child in my office many, many years ago, and his mother was uh, uh, came in, and, and she was uh, really, I guess, a tiger mom. She mm -hmm. really had him signed up for everything, uh, piano and guitar, and he did sports, and, and I was another thing on her list for him to do therapy. Yeah. In, in New York City, people love therapy. Oh, my uh, goodness. Bless it, them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so... This this kid was uh, about 11 years old and he was very unhappy. I could see it right away. And his mother was fed up. How could he be unhappy? I've done all these things for him. I'm all I all my whole life is structured. So I and just giving him what he needs. And how could he be unhappy? And anyway, I got him alone. Mm -hmm. And I asked him what many therapists who work with children, the magic question, 
which is if you could change anything in your life, if you had one wish, what would you wish for? And most kids want to be superheroes. Most people want, kids want magical powers. So this kid thought long and hard. Hmm. And I'll never forget, he said to me, I wish my mother was happy. <gasps> oh. And it was, it was heartbreaking because uh, she was working hard to be a parent while neglecting herself and complaining to him all the time. Wow. So uh, the he anxious parent. Very aware of her. He was very aware of how she was feeling, but that wasn't a conversation they were having in a, in a productive or healthy way. Well, yeah, be, also because it's not, it's not equal ground. Kids mm -hmm. don't have, they have lots of feelings and not that many words. Mm -hmm. uh, where an adult can sort of flood a child with words, mm -hmm. child doesn't have that range of self-expression. Right. And they and they pick up on these things. And uh, another story uh, I like to tell, and this was this only happened two years ago, a uh, 15 year old as I was seeing individually. He asked me to have a family meeting, which is very rare. Most teenagers loathe family meetings. I, I have trouble in family meetings. Wow. They're, they're tough. And he wanted I want a meeting with my parents. I thought, OK, mm -hmm. uh, what do you want to talk about? Oh, I have an idea. And I said, OK, so we call his parents. Parents come and sit down. And they're ready to go to town. He doesn't do his homework. He doesn't get up on time, but blah, blah, blah. They start launching into their litany of complaints. Mm -hmm. And he says, and I'm sitting right beside him, beside him he says, we're not going to talk about that today. <laughs> okay. And I was stunned, and they were stunned. And I said, well, what are we talking about? And he looks at his parents. He goes, I know you two hate each other. Wow. And I want to know why. And wow. I sat there so stunned. And the parents were so upset with me. They thought I had arranged this whole thing. Oh, no. But he saw that they didn't share a bedroom. They never were affectionate. physically affectionate mm -hmm. with each other. He would go over to other friends' houses, and their parents were joking and playing. And that was not the world he grew up in. They had no clue how much he knew without them ever saying a word. That's incredible. Well, and it underscores this very important reality that kids know so much more than we think they know about us and about the family. Oh, yeah. Well, like, how old is your youngest child? He's six. He's six. Oh, my so youngest? No, I have a daughter who's two and a half. Oh, good God. Okay. <laughs> my greatest sympathies. <laughs> My kids good are times. off good times in the world. Here. Yeah, <laughs> yes, <I'm> sure. <laughs> well, it always amazes to me that our child will know what will approach certain people, will shy away from certain people. Mm -hmm. They're as intuitive as animals, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. So they, they will pick up no matter what you say. They see your behavior. They see how you interact, your communication style. They know more than you ever think they do. Yeah, which is both very useful to know and also terrifying. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and to be able to hear your child when they, my daughter, I remember in the kitchen, my wife and I were arguing about something, just inane thing. I, I don't really even remember. It was just a minor argument. Mm -hmm. And my uh, daughter, I think she was in second grade. She said, stop arguing. Stop arguing. We said, why? I said, you're going to get divorced. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And we had to sit down and say like, uh, we can argue and we still love each other. We disagree. We're not, no one's getting divorced here, hmm. you know, uh, but being open to that kind of, kind of communication and, and exploring it rather than shutting it down right. makes such a difference in a child's life. Then they can come back to you with their worries and concerns where the anxious parent, they really don't want to burden the parent, the burden that the parents already mm -hmm. got so much on their plate and you right. can't bring in a problem to them. Right. It would just make them sadder or more anxious. Yeah. Wow. That's right. That's right. So, so what's the third group? I, I feel like I've completely depressed you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I the coffee's worn sign. off. No. <laughs> well, all right. It's going to get better. You know better. what it is? I think there's just so much here and I, I know we won't get to all of it today. And I think I feel very profoundly that I want parents to have this information. I know it's made a huge difference in my life as I've gone on this parenting journey. And I mean, your book has been a wonderful addition to that. It's just, it's a profound journey, this parenting thing. It's, it's very humbling. It's very beautiful. It's very, it stretches, it stretched me in almost every way. And it wasn't, it wasn't what I expected. I really, like I said, at the beginning of the interview, I really I had this sense that, you know, I kind of know, know how to deal with kids and I can kind of, you know, I'd worked in schools and 
I just really felt like it it it, it would be fine. <laughs> so I it's just you. it's a profound profound experience and I I'm just I'm grateful that you're offering your expertise and wisdom and I I'm, I'm just I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful and I'm hopeful that parents will be able to take this information in and use it. And I just I'm also I think maybe what you're sensing is I'm also just aware of the work I've done, but there's just that there's more work to do <laughs> in my own, in my own family. Yeah. So That's true. And, and I think there's a an empathic connection between parents and non-parents. Mm -hmm. I noticed when I, I had my child and I was pushing her first child, pushing her down the street in the stroller. And I would see another dad pushing <laughs> his screaming child down the street in the so, so stroller. Mm -hmm. And I didn't care what he looked like, where he came from. When we locked eyes, we right. were brothers, <laughs> you know? Right. No, it is. It's like, it's, it's like joining a tribe, you know, a new, a new community that is, yeah, profound. And it's kind of a rite of passage really. So, yeah. And no one's prepared. No one gets, no one gets a pass. I would mm -hmm. say at any <laughs> point in my practice, a quarter of the kids I see are kids of therapists, psychiatrists, yeah. psychologists. No <laughs> one gets a pass. I had a I had a book on my shelf for years written by this man, uh, which I really adored about therapy. And uh, after I was off into my career and st things started happening, he called me to see his son. <gasps> and I said, I can't see your son. <laughs> I, you know, don't you I know was, who you are? I was like, yeah, are you, you're the God of parenting. And uh, he set up an appointment and uh, he canceled the appointment. And then he called me and said, I'm sorry, we're canceling the appointment. I'm sending him to boarding school. I can't take anymore. <laughs> no, you're joking. This is a true story. <laughs> this is a true story. And uh, I oh really, it, it, it was so humbling. And I spoke to him a few years ago and his son's doing great and things are great. But as a parent, we, we all <laughs> face our immaturities. We face our shortcomings. Mm. We're thrown into this. It's like packing your bags to go to Hawaii and landing in Alaska. <laughs> you know, we, we just don't know until we're there. Yeah. And then we have to survive it. So, so the, <laughs> um, the last parenting one, I hope this is less depressing. Uh, <laughs> I the doubt last it. <laughs> okay. The last parenting uh, model uh, or, or type, type would be mm -hmm. the fix, fix everything parent. Again, mm. I was great at that. This is a parent that just wants frustration to go away. Wants to, uh, oh, I can do that. I'll fix it. What do you want here? Take it. What do you want? Yeah. I, they just try, try to keep the peace all the time. So, mm. um, you know, as children, frustration is the driving force for maturity. So as a child, confronts frustration and wrestles with it and then masters it, they experience a burst of maturity. Like kids mm. learn a few words and then they're talking in sentences or they walk and then suddenly they're running. Yeah. The maturity leap when they master frustration is phenomenal. It, with the fix everything parent, they, they can't stand to see their child frustrated. So they jump in and, 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 and give them what they need. And what they do is they interrupt that process and this really infuriates the child. Uh, I saw this. Uh, There's another story. Oh, this is really going to depress you. Are, you. are you sure you're up for this? <laughs> yes, I'm ready. Uh, this, uh, I came up with the idea. I was dropping my second child off for uh, kindergarten. And, um, and there was this uh, little boy there, uh, Anthony, who I would watch every day building a, a Lego plane, an airplane, which is really hard to do. He's like looking at the box trying to recreate the plane. I say, hi, Anthony. Hi. And he's working on the plane. And so a few days go by, the plane's come along nicely and I'm dropping my daughter and, and Anthony's dad is dropping off, which I had never seen. It always been a babysitter. And I'm watching from a distance and doing my thing with my own daughter. And Anthony's dad sits next to him and says, hey, what are you doing, buddy? And Anthony says, I'm building a plane. He's, mm. Oh, is this your plane? You did it all wrong. <gasps> and he pulls it apart. He pulls it apart. Oh, no. And I, I'm there like I've oh, just no. witnessed a murder. Oh, right? my God. Yes. <laughs> yes. And but this is crazy. You're trying to explain to someone because it's such a simple moment. So mm. Anthony starts crying. Now he's upset. And his father's, what's the matter with you? Why are you crying? I'm trying to help you. Now the father's getting angry. Mm. Now Anthony's getting angry. And so Anthony throws the Legos up in the air and screams. And his father gets furious. How, you know, just How let's dare lose. you. Yeah. How dare you? And I'm trying to help you. You don't appreciate it. Now, Anthony bangs his head on the table. 
Uh, and the teachers intervene and they sort of pick him up and he's screaming and they drag him out of the classroom like a drunken sailor in a bar. <laughs> and he's and and the father turns to the teacher and say, we have this trouble at home. I don't know. It's just he's always been this way. Oh, no, so, uh, that is so depressing. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just <laughs> rock bottom. We're going to the sub basement, Claire. Uh, don't worry. So, I've been there uh, before. <laughs> Okay, yeah. yeah. I have a condo in the sub basement. <laughs> wow. So the idea that, that he he in his mind he was rescuing his child. His child yeah. was, he saw him struggling. But right, and he had the best he had the best intentions. You had know? The best intentions. We all we just have the best intentions. <laughs> I I'm sure there are a lot of criminals that say that too. Oh <laughs> no. The best intentions. Oh no. True. But uh but it, so the fix everything parent is learning to, again, starting with the parent as the patient really is the person I want to work with. Uh, if they can inhibit that impulse hmm. and, and let their kid help them support them through the frustration, then we're moving on to a whole nother level. But okay. if he's a fix everything parent, that creates a dependency on the parent. The child doesn't want to be dependent on the parent, especially as they get older. So they, they resent the parent. Then we have the the building blocks for this bullying relationship where mm. the child may uh, bully the parent, the parent may bully the child back. And uh, we've got a long haul. They're not right. even a, to adolescence yet right. uh, before these things really hit the fan. Right. Wow. And I'm just thinking through the process that, you know, may be happening for the parent and wondering about, you know, it sounds like I'm imagining that the parent probably had these experiences children themselves, you know, experienced That's frustration, right. experienced anxiety, and and that they may have found those experiences intolerable. Or maybe they had a level of experience of those things that wasn't attended to ever, right? Or there's some reason that they feel this need to jump in. And so you're you're you in the book and now are are helping parents to turn inward to kind of understand those those wounds. You said earlier, you mentioned asking a mom to kind of explore those vulnerabilities. So what would parents look for? You know, how would they, where would they start to try to understand what's mo motivating their own behavior? Okay, that's a great question. And this is probably what gets me fired a lot because <laughs> people want mm -hmm. you to fix their children. Mm -hmm. And I'm always saying, I'll get to your child, but let's start with you. So what I'm really asking for for them is to insert a reflective pause between impulse and action. Mm -hmm. Just a pause before they make a choice as a parent. Just to even that pause, that moment of reflection will ground them mm -hmm. so they don't become so impulsive where they don't get caught in these reactive loops. Child does something and then you react. Next, I want them to identify, okay, where do these power struggles live and breathe? Do they happen first thing in the morning? Mm -hmm. Do they happen late at night? Do they happen in public? Do they happen in private? Where do they happen? And begin to, as scientifically as possible, chart where we're going to focus on. Like a lot of parents, I, I do a workshop now on uh, technology and, mm. uh, and children, and, uh, you, and I've come up with this screen time contract for an entire family when the Wi-Fi is turned off, and if you get your device in the morning after you have breakfast and you're dressed and ready to go to school, little structures like this. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you walk into your seven-year-old's bedroom and it's you're running late and he's sitting in his pajamas as he's been playing for 30 minutes a uh, game on his phone or something, mm -hmm. you know, we got a big power struggle there. So I really want to chart the course of the family. And then once they sort of understand where they're coming from in terms of their history and like you you your family is very unique right mm -hmm. your husband's from india and mm -hmm. and i'd want to explore you know what conflicts or what disagreements come up in terms of your parenting styles get them talking make sure they have a uh they they have a good uh they're taking care of themselves as a couple when do they what are they doing together what do they have mm -hmm. what do they do for fun mm -hmm. and then the last thing i really want to introduce and I can't believe I, I do this because I hated them as a child because uh, family meetings, mm -hmm. family meetings was 90 minutes of my father ranting. Uh, <laughs> but that's not the family meeting. Oh, you may listen to this. I'm sorry, dad. <laughs> family meeting is where we can sit down when everyone's relaxed, when everyone's eaten, when it's and no one's rushing to get out the door and talk about what we're going to do, how, we, how we're going to live together, mm. who's taking whose stuff. 
And children actually start to make lists to talk at the family meeting, and they want to put it on the family agenda, and and uh, cool. it becomes a a forum uh, for discussion. And, and rather than working these things, these things or these conflicts out when you're just not in a good place. Mm. Well, and everyone has a voice, right? It sounds like in that in that environment, everyone is valued and everyone has a voice. Everyone has an opportunity to impact the system, impact the family culture, and that's. That's right. And you have to look at it. For me, if you if your child is the problem and approach it in that way, you're, you're really uh, targeting the child and making them feel like something's wrong with them. But if we look at, you know, as a family, I had a family in my office yesterday. It was, boy, they were at each other. And I said, I think you all have something in common. I said, what? I said, everyone is unhappy. Mm. Everyone's unhappy with the way this family is, is running. Mm. And we got, got to figure out another way of being. You know, so it helps when you when you get into these binds that you have someone like a therapist or a counselor, or even a friend who can be that referee, who can step in. Because you and I know when you're in the parenting mode, you can lose yourself. Yeah. Uh, so it helps to have a space or someone you trust to say, hey, you seem really cranky lately. So uh, those would be on. the first things I would do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it also makes me reflect on kind of our cultural norms and values right now, just around Facebook and, you know, this and that and celebrity culture. And, you know, parents as parents, I think we're we're not that keen on seeking help. Right. Because it's a sign that there's we're somehow defective or something's wrong or we we don't have this picture perfect life that people try to portray on Facebook or on Instagram. And there's just a lot of these cultural pressures right now that I think are you know, contribute to people not being communal and collective and reaching out for help and saying, you know, needing help is is okay. <laughs> needing help. Everyone That's will need right. help at some That's point right. in time for something, you know, and if you're living a, there's no such thing as a perfect life. There's only perfectly imperfect. And how much pressure we all, I feel, are under just to to be perfect and be great at everything because somehow we should, which is really sad, actually, and, and really not um, very realistic to put it mildly. So mm. yeah, so there's, I can see why parents are want to blame kids and not look in the mirror because it's hard to look in the mirror. There's a lot of shame and a lot of pain that comes up when we have to look at our family and yeah. say, actually, I did this. I, you know, I did this or my partner, uh, and I did this and uh, kind of getting through that initial suffering. I'm, it's tough. Well, yeah, I, I, I've many times felt bankrupt as a parent. Just I, I didn't know what to do and uh, didn't know where to turn. And so having having a community or having people you can talk to for me was like a uh, like a, just an anchor in a storm. It just really held. I was able to hold fast to it until it passed. Yeah. So yeah, I think the more that we share our struggles and and our concerns and our regrets, I think the more we can learn from each other. And when I run parenting groups, I had to tell you, I was doing a photo shoot in my office when the book came out. They or they, mm -hmm. they were getting ready and they wanted a, a shot of me mm -hmm. and I run lots of groups. So I said, could we do a shot when I'm running a group? Because that's where I feel most comfortable. And they said, sure. So I gather up from where I work uh, a bunch of uh, uh, secretaries and uh, manager of the clinic uh -huh. and anyone I could get it. So we're going to do a fake group. You're going to sit in a circle and they're going to take <laughs> pictures of me. And they were great. Okay. We can do that. So I pile them in my office, like six, seven of them. Mm -hmm. And I said, all right, uh, let's talk about this. And, and suddenly everyone started confessing. You got a real group. I knew this. Was and suddenly the one secretary said, my mother was an alcoholic and my, <laughs> my daughter's failing in school and I don't know what to do. So people, when you create a safe space, uh, and they feel it's accepted. And I certainly tried to do this in the book. I didn't want to come off like a no at all. I think that's where that's where we can really learn from each other. Mm. Yeah, I just yeah, I think as parents, we all kind of, you know, we kind of test the waters with people to see, you know, can I be vulnerable with you? Is it safe? Are you a person who's going to be real and honest with me? Do you struggle? And I think you know, we we if we're lucky, hopefully we all find some really good connections like the one you're ones you're speaking about. Um, but even if people aren't willing to be vulnerable, just to have the knowledge that it's it's very likely that they all that we all have our struggles and to just kind of That's be right. able to carry that compassion around with us and and 
try not to judge ourselves and compare ourselves to others that we perceive as being having it all together or not struggling right. in this exact same way. And I talk about, you know, putting together a support team as a parent who's on your support team and making identifying them because there is a lot of people out there are trained and ready people at school guidance counselors psychologists mm -hmm. programs that don't go it alone mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. especially as your kid moves closer to adolescence they need relationships outside the orbit of the family they need models and mentors people they can look up to if it's just you again that's too intense for the yeah. average teenager mm -hmm. so uh not going alone means making an appointment going in and saying I need your advice, or I'm really worried about this, or my son is struggling in math and I don't know what to do anymore. Anything, open it up. I'm always amazed. And I've certainly, as a parent, I remember my daughter was in middle school and I just, I can't remember the, the exact scene, but I remember being in the guidance counselor's office. And my daughter was so unhappy and uh, mm. I, I just felt so devastated and defeated uh, mm. somehow that, uh, that she was suffering so much. Yeah. And, uh, but ultimately, you know, we get through these things and it deepens our compassion yeah. uh, and it deepens our humanity. Yeah. So we're not so quick to judge people. We're not so quick to separate ourselves or label people, see the world as black and white. There are these, these gray areas that we live in, really. Yeah. Well, you know what? That's a beautiful, I think, moment to end on and just, yeah, just to underscore our shared humanity and just the reality that we're all in this together and it, it's not easy but it has a lot of beauty wow well sean there's so much more we could talk about but i so appreciate <laughs> you <laughs> in fact Thank i'll be you. calling you later and making an appointment <laughs> <laughs> i want to try that coffee you had before this interview. yeah really. <laughs> really gave you a lift <laughs> thanks again for sharing your you know all of your expertise and wisdom with with all of us. Well, and thank you, Claire. And thank you for the important work you're doing oh, uh, really in supporting mothers. That. I mean, we really struggled with our second child. And, and uh, when I looked at your site, I kept thinking, wow, I wish my mm -hmm. wife could have seen this. I wish we could have both sat down. And, oh. and so it's, please keep doing what you're doing. It's, it's so important. And I feel we're at a time in our history where maybe women can really uh, get the respect and attention they deserve. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us for today's episode. I loved talking with Sean about how doing our own self-care and personal work as parents can restructure the family and shift bullying behaviors toward more intimacy, less anxiety, and greater satisfaction for both parents and kids. We explore some foundational concepts in the interview, but I can enthusiastically recommend that you read Sean's book and begin to apply his perspective to your own parenting life. I very much appreciate that Sean's expertise grew out of his own suffering as a parent and his willingness to explore his own process and contribution to the problem. May we all be brave enough to look in the mirror and discover how we may contribute to the most difficult struggles we have with our kids. For more information on Sean, please visit his website, www.seangrover.com, where you can find links to his many valuable offerings. To get the show notes, sign up for our e-course, or get more information, go to www.honestmamas.com forward slash episode 41. Also, join our community on Facebook by going to www.facebook.com forward slash honestmamascommunity, where these conversations will continue. 